right. Well, good morning, everybody. I hope everybody is uh, able to see and hear everything well as we get going here this morning. Mm -hmm. That's okay. What's wrong? Don't worry about it. We'll, we'll, we'll record it off of Facebook. <laughs> Um, yeah, I should have mentioned that to you. Uh, we're pumping our audio through completely through Facebook, so hopefully everything is running well with us this morning, um, and we'll have good sound and good video as we follow along. Um, if there are any issues, as usual, please go ahead and just keep calling Aaron until he answers, or send him text, actually, since he'll be sitting right here, um, or Ethan, if you have that number. Uh, just keep us aware of any technical difficulties we may be having. Uh, we continue to test and to try out ways of getting this to work well, so we hope that this morning uh, it'll run pretty smooth for everybody. Well, uh, first I want to say Happy Mother's Day. Um, it is a beautiful day now that the sun has, uh, or, and now the sun has cleared away the snow for us, and a time that we get to uh, rejoice and celebrate uh, the mothers in our life. And I'm looking forward today to uh, Dan actually bringing us a, a short message on, uh, mother, on a Mother's Day message there, uh, which we'll be getting to in just a moment. But first, we have a few announcements uh, to give. The first one is we have a graduation. Graduation's coming up here soon for many people. I know I actually uh, should have been walking just yesterday in my commencement, uh, but things are a little different uh, nowadays, so we're doing commencement online for my class. But we have a number of high school students who are graduating as well. If you have a graduating senior in your house, please let us know. Uh, we're hoping to do a, uh, a ceremony later on in June to uh, celebrate that accomplishment of graduating. Uh, so if you do have a senior in your home, please go ahead and send us their information. Give us their first name and last name so that we know who they are, so we can recognize them for the work that they put in to reach, uh, reach this point in their academic career. Now, we sent this out in the email earlier this week. Uh, but just in case you missed it, we are looking for someone to head up a care team. Uh, so we're looking for someone to volunteer as a care team leader. Uh, this person would be uh, in a position to, uh, a volunteer position to support families, particularly looking at someone who's able to organize uh, meal trains for families with little kid or with uh, new babies. If you have any interest in that at all, um, please reach out to either me or one of the deacons so that uh, we can get that rolling. Uh, we're excited to see how that could develop. Again, we're starting with meal trains here, but that would go uh, whichever direction that whoever the Lord calls into that position uh, would like to lead that. Again, if you have an interest in that, please reach out to either me or reach out to one of the deacons. Now, as usual, after service today, uh, we will be having a coffee hour at 1 p.m. I'll be sending out that link as well this morning, though it is the same link that we used uh, the previous week. So you can use that one to hop on. That's been a really good time just to see one another's faces and connect a little bit. Uh, I know it's been a lot of fun for me and Chantel and the kiddos when they're able to hop on. And I look forward to seeing anyone who's able to make it there today. Again, that will be a link that we'll send out uh, by email, though you might already have it. Uh, and that pulls up a Zoom meeting to join together. Well, those are the announcements for today so far. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to Dan, who's going to lead us in a, uh, in a Mother's Day uh, devotion here. Good morning. Pastor Mike said to keep or said something about it short, so I'll try to keep it that way. Mother's Day. Today is the day we set aside to honor our mothers. I'm going to read some verses from Proverbs 31. Proverbs 31, verses 10 through 28. An excellent wife who can find. She is for, m far more precious than jewels. The heart of her husband trusts in her, and he will have no lack of gain. She does him good and not harm all the days of her life. She seeks wool and flax and works with willing hands. She is like the ships of the merchant. She brings her food from afar. 
She rises while it is yet night and provides food for her household and portions for her maidens. She considers a field and buys it with the fruit of her hands and plants a vineyard. She dresses herself with strength and makes her arms strong. She perceives that her merchandise is profitable. Her lamp does not go out at night. She puts her hands to the distaff and her hands hold the spindle. She opens her hand to the poor and reaches out her hands to the needy. She is not afraid of snow for her household, for all her household is clothed in scarlet. She makes bed coverings for herself. Her clothing is fine linen and purple. Her husband is known in the gates when he sits among the elders of the land. She makes linen garments and sells them. She delivers sashes to the merchants. Strength and diligently her, her clothing and she laughs at the time to come. She opens her mouth with wisdom and the teaching of kindness is on her tongue. She looks well to the way of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. Her children rise up and call her blessed, her husband also, and he praises her. These verses remind us of things that we may overlook about mothers. Um, I'm going to share some things that I've taken from these verses with you. Uh, first of all, I'd like to say I was able to talk to my mom this morning on the phone. She is still in the nursing home at Cuba, and we are not able to see her. So I called her this morning and shared her with us, told her that um, I was going to be sharing this. And if I get a little emotional, um, please forgive me. Um, I got emotional of her this morning. Um, some of the things that stand out to us in these verses is she seeks to always do good for her, her family. No whatever she does, her best interest is in it for that of her family. She makes sure her cupboards are well stocked, providing for physical needs, for flu, food, clothing, and essentials, even when at this time they are hard to get. She rises while it is still night, even when needs are early, she is there. She'll get up early in the morning if one of the kids are uh, sick or having problems. Her lamp, lamp does not go out at night. Makes me think that while she is asleep, her mind is even on her family. She dresses herself in strength and makes herself strong. Even if she is not feeling well, she pulls up her bootstraps and continues to carry on mother's responsibilities. <clears throat> she makes sure her family's clothed no matter what the weather is outside. She uses her hands and her talents to provide. She is a teacher, teaching right from wrong, helping with homework, using her wisdom to prepare them for life's challenges. She shows kindness and compassion, is an example in the way of uh, helping the needy. She is never idle, whether it is making meals, washing clothes, holding her children in the times when they are not feeling well, grocery shopping, helping with homework, when perhaps for a few moments to relax, she is always ready to help with the needs of her family, and here to listen, a hand to help, a prayer for safety, health, and endless hours praying silently, faithful for salvation of her children. So thank you, moms, for your endless love and devotion to us. Mom, thank you for, your, for loving me even the, to this day. Thank you for your godly example to me. Thank you most of all for your continuing prayers for me. <clears throat> Lori, thank you for your love your faithfulness to Jeremy and Emily. While they were growing up and now as they have families of their own. Emily, Stephanie, thank you for the love and faithfulness to your children, my grandchildren. To all you mothers, no matter what phase of motherhood you are in right now, we thank you. 
we honor you today. May God continue to bless you. May the love of Christ be seen in you. Happy Mother's Day. about uh, thinking about mothers and how I've been blessed with a wonderful mother and this wonderful mother of my children and it was making me think a little bit of Timothy you know when he's being told what a blessing it is that he has with his mother and his grandmother um, Eunice that they have built into his life it is wonderful how moms really are so critical to our spiritual development I know I've seen that in my life for my own mom and the encouragement and I've seen that in Chantel, as she is loved and is raising our children. It is such a blessing. Um, so thank you, moms out there. Thank you, my mom, hopefully watching out there. And thank you, Chantel, for being such a wonderful mother. You guys really are worthy of great honor for what you do for the church. All right. Well, let's go ahead now and uh, turn to our memory verse that we've been working on. So we're going through Colossians 3. Um, and we'll be doing Colossians 3, uh, verse 8 this morning. Uh, so please turn there with me if you have that. Again, that is Colossians chapter 3, and we're going over, we are learning verse 8 together. Now I am reading out of the ESV here. Uh, please go ahead and use whatever version that you have available to you there at home. Uh, we'll see how well we're doing with this and getting it down, but again, this is Colossians 3, verse 8. So wherever you are, uh, let's go ahead and read this together, and we can try and do as much by memory as possible as well. And here's what Paul says. But now you must put them all away, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Colossians 3, 8. All right, well, let's, um, let's go before the Lord in prayer for some of the prayers and prayer requests that have come up. Um, in the past week, there's been a number of illnesses and things that have, uh, uh, that have arisen. And we have some, quite a few things to praise God for as well. Uh, I know if you've been following our prayer list, you've seen that uh, Dale is back in the hospital right now. And, um, and our brother Dwayne uh, is having some appointments as well. So we want to keep them up in prayer. We've also had a number of little ones recently born. Uh, so praises for that and prayers for the families. We also want to be lifting up our leadership uh, before God in prayer, um, especially in this challenging time, that we would be remembering them and lifting them up. And in fact, I, I'd like to go ahead and ask uh, Luke to come up, if he can, to lead us in prayer before we uh, jump into the Word this morning. If you have any other prayer requests uh, at all, please uh, go ahead and share them on Facebook with one another who's watching so that we can keep those in prayer as well. Um, but, but Luke... Let's pray. Jesus, uh, I just want to thank you for all the mothers we have and how they're such good caretakers and are always there for us when you need. I just thank you for them, Lord. And uh, I also thank you for allowing them to keep us safe in this time and that you keep us safe as well with these different challenging times, Lord. And uh, I just pray as Pastor Mike, he's, he comes and preaches, pray that you will help it to affect our lives and we can use it, and he will preach your word, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, we'll see how audio continues to work. But before we open up the scriptures today, I, I did get a letter uh, for us to read from the Gilbert family. Uh, in response to uh, some of the outreach that members of this church ha have made here. And I, I want to read this for you from Ed. Uh, Ed says here, Dear Rushford Baptist Church, thank you so much for your outpouring of sympathy at this time. We appreciated your thoughtfulness and prayers. You have been a special part of our lives throughout the years. It's very sweet to, to see that lived out. 
uh, as we live out the life of the church, to love those around us, our brothers and sisters who are uh, struggling and hurting through various things. And with that, let us go ahead and turn to the Word. Now, if you have any issues hearing it at this point, please, again, reach out so that we can uh, get any audio issues fixed and dealt with. Um, But hopefully things are coming through clear this morning. So, submission. That has been our topic for the last few weeks, and I am sure that you've heard enough of it for a while uh, at this point. And as we come to our, our text today, I would say it seems that Peter Peter's sort of agreeing a little bit with us because we begin to move from submission to our next main topic that we find in this letter. But before we do this, he takes a short little break to talk about blessing. Now, it's interesting because when I think of blessing, I don't always associate it with submission. Uh, those two don't necessarily always go together in my mind. In fact, if anything, blessing can be the opposite of submission. It's a blessing to have our own way, right? It's a blessing uh, to be able to choose what we want. And, but we all want a blessed life, right? I mean, we want to live in blessing, and I think it's a pretty fair guess that we all find ourselves in that position. We want to live a, a blessed life. But what is a blessing? Uh, what does it mean to be blessed? Now, that word it has a lot of connotations for us. You know, if we say blessing, what does it mean? I mean, it, it can be a state of being. It can be an action. It can be a filler word, or it can be worse. Now, in the Old Testament, it often directly related to having kids. A blessing meant having many children, whether it felt like a blessing at a time or not. But for us, as we say blessings, uh, well, we can use that as a word of a prayer. You know, we're going to say blessings. We're going to bless our food. How does, the food, how does food get blessed? We're going to bless our God. Well, what does that mean? We ask for blessings. When someone is charitable, provides something for us, we receive their blessing. We might seek a blessing when we want to do something. Say you're seeking a hand in marriage. Better have her father's blessing, right? Someone sneezes, what do we say? Bless you! The word is almost as bad as love and how many different ways that we use it and how many different meanings that it has. Um, anything from permission to money. Now, I am a northern boy. It is true. Uh, but I learned something. I picked up something when I lived down south for a little bit. And it is oh, one of those, another use of the word blessing. You might have heard this before, but it's a simple phrase. And it's just, well, bless her heart or bless your heart. Now, see, what's interesting is for all of our views of blessing, that one now, the bless your heart, well, that, that doesn't actually mean something good. Usually that's this kin to saying, oh, goodness, you, you, you're, you're stupid. I know it's harsh, but it is true. Oh, bless her heart. Oh, bless your heart. Usually at the end of trying to point out something that you're doing wrong. So, yeah, blessing. What is a blessing? Oh, it's a complicated word, isn't it? Well, I mean, in the, in the Hebrew... We have the word uh, for blessing, Baruch. Baruch. Uh, As mentioned already, it means to be fertile. But it also meant receiving power. To be blessed meant to have special power bestowed by God. So we see the mighty men of old who were blessed, had the hand of God on their life, and you could see the power of God on them. And to bless someone was to either give power or to ask that power was bestowed. And to bless God was to acknowledge that he is the source of all power. And moving to the New Testament, we have this word blessing in the word uh, eulogia. You might catch there, if you listen to that, the word eulogy. Because it's the same word, literally meaning a good word. A good word. See, a eulogy is a good word about somebody. And a eulogia was a good word of grace or power on somebody. To bless, then, is to say a good thing that is on somebody, to acknowledge it or to ask for it. To be blessed, then, is to have that good on you for it to be said of you. And that power or particular notice of God, God would bestow something and would recognize that. Well, that, that results in you being blessed. So for us to say that we want to be blessed, well, it often means to live a good life, whatever that good might be for us as we define it. And that's sort of how Peter is using this idea 
of a blessed life here today? Do you want to live a good life? Do you want to live a blessed life? Well, how do you do that? If your context is you're a sojourner in this place, living in exile outside of your homeland, where you're from, in a place that is not your home, while we're called to live in submission, and while we're told that we're going to suffer, how do you live the good life? And that is what we see that Peter addresses here for us today. So please go ahead and open your Bibles again uh, and turn with me to 1 Peter. We're going to 1 Peter, and we're going to be reading through chapter 3, verses 8 through 12. Again, that's 1 Peter, and we are reading chapter 3, verses 8 through 12. And here, we find Peter talking about a blessing. See, as we've been following along with Peter, we've moved from this section on what it means to be the church to how we live out the church. How do we live out that life? And how do we live a life focused on the glory of God? of God. And the first answer that Peter gave us as we went through uh, chapter 2 in the first part of chapter 3, the first answer to that was submission. Submission to government, submission in our workplace, submission in our homes. And that submission that we live out, it demonstrates the submission that we have to God. And it seeks to leave the glory for him. Well, now we're looking at living this out, this life of the church out in front of people together as the church. So again, picking up here in verse 8, he he says this, finally, all of you have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, and a humble mind. Do not repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, bless. For to this you were called that you may obtain a blessing. For whoever desires to love life and see good days, Let him keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayers. For the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. In the midst of submission, this is how we live a blessed life. Today, we're going to be looking at at that in three parts here. We're going to be looking at the attitude of a blessed life, the action of a blessed life, and the aim of a blessed life. The attitude, the action, and the aim of a blessed life, as Peter talks about it here. Well, starting with that first verse that we just read, we see the attitude that we should have if we want to have a blessed life. Now, it starts just like this. Finally, finally. And you know, as any good preacher, and Peter is a great preacher, this means that if you're lucky, he might be halfway done with his message. But finally, we come here, and we're getting to a very important part. So what are we to do? All of you have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, and a humble mind. There are five attitudes that we should have if we want to live a blessed life. Each of these is primarily something that we exercise in the church. This is how we interact with one another in church. But it should be reflected to the world as that love overflows. So let's take a moment to to look at these five. Again, unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, tender heart, and humble mind. So the structure that we have here that 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 peter is giving us this in it's very interesting he's using a a literary form um uh, that's called a chiasm or a chiastic structure and what that means that comes from the word the greek letter chi uh, which actually forms a bit of an x or a cross it's the first letter in the name of christ um, and it's a letter that uh, sort of gives shape to the way that he's writing here See, when you use this form, you you sort of go on an ideal, you go out, and then you come back, making a bit of an X shape. And usually what's in the middle, what's in the middle is most important. You could almost think of it like a pyramid. That's sort of the structure that he is setting up here for us. Uh, And so right here, what we have is, on the first layer, we have unity of mind, and on the other side, we have humble mind. And then if you go up the next level, we have sympathy, and we have tender heart. And then at the very top, the middle segment of this, we have love. So we're building up to love, and love is at the center of our attitude 
if we are seeking to live a blessed life. With that structure in mind, we start with the idea of the unity of mind. Now, unity of mind here, this is just comes from two words stuck together, meaning common and understanding. It's a way of understanding that's held in common amongst people, a unity of mind. But this is not conformity, or uniformity. Uh, the church is not uniform in what it does. I mean, really, it can't be. You know, Paul teaches us that the church of the, bo- uh, the body of Christ, it's made of up of different members that all have different functions. We are different, and the truth is, we all have different opinions. A unity of mind is not having the same opinions. It's having the same focus. When he says, have unity of mind, you need to have the same focus, which is Christ. See, you might like blue, that's fine, and I might like red, that's okay. You might like fast music, I might like slow music. That's okay. It's okay to have difference of opinion. In fact, if you were able, if you were to uh, uh, watch last week or if you were with us last week, you, you might have heard me talk about my wife's desire to have dog. Um, truth, truth told, I uh, came pretty close to it last week. One did sort of catch my heart a little bit, but, well, it went to somebody else. So no dog yet there. Um, but really, we have a difference of opinion, me and Chantel on when to get a dog, the timing of that. But that doesn't mean that we're not united. Now, if we chose to fight over it, if we chose to argue over it, if we chose to let that be a divide for us, so if Chantel decided to go out and buy a dog without knowing, hoping that you know forgiveness is easier than permission, well, yeah, then we would not have unity of mind. Uh, but we're on the same page with one another, that we want to see to love the other that we are seeking the interest of the other person. Now, this one can be a hard one for us in general as a people because the truth is we have a lot of opinions. I know for one, I I am a fairly opinionated person. I have a lot of them, and I know many people who have many opinions. And we're prone to look at those differences rather than those places where we have unity. But choosing to live with unity of mind meaning focus on Christ first and foremost and seeking the benefit of the other, that's the first step in a blessed life. Remember, Jesus spoke about this time and time again, saying, have unity of mind, be of one mind, that they may be one over and over again. And it is something for us to chase after. Have unity of mind with your fellow believers. Keep your focus where it needs to be. So that's the first. Well, the second is sympathy here. Now, our Greek word sympathy is actually, or our word sympathy is derived straight from the Greek word, some pathos, or, you know, some with, and pathos, feeling, to feel with someone, to experience the feelings of another person, to step into a situation with someone so that you can effectively love them and even sometimes share the burden for them. In the church, we cannot allow the hurts and pains of our brothers and sisters to pass us by without affecting us. Uh, seeing that, uh, seeing someone hurting and just, well, just blessing their heart, that's not good enough. Uh, Jesus was our example in this, jumping into our situation fully in order that he'd be sympathetic. Now, just a transparent moment here for me. Um, this is an area that I really do struggle in. You know, I have this disposition of, uh, general happiness, you know, um, that, that doesn't get usually af- easily affected by things. And I can have a hard time emotionally stepping into someone else's shoes. I, I can feel for them, but I struggle at times to feel with them. And it's not like I haven't had, a, you know, hardships to deal with uh, or whatnot, uh, but it just takes me a lot of work to connect with another person's hardship. And I want to encourage those of you out there who might be like me, because we are out there. Uh, now, some people I know find this easy. I, I think my wife is a great example. She can feel with people in a wonderful way. Other people might find it too easy, that you're drawn too much into the emotional struggles of other people and let it sort of run over you. Uh, but I'm speaking now to those who really struggle to even begin this process. Um, take it from someone who, who walks through that. Take time to figure this one out. Take the time to figure this one out. You can learn how to do it, but it's going to take a conscious effort and a willingness to be uncomfortable, to actually allow those emotions to play. 
Because, I mean, I know the feeling myself. When tears want to flow, it's like, oh, no, better stop them. Uh, no, we've got to be there with people in their pain and in their hurts. So let, it, let yourself enter in to those feelings. Because we need to be sympathetic if we're seeking to live a blessed life and follow what Peter is teaching here. Well, next, it's love. Brotherly love. The love that we have for one another. Now, all of the attitudes that we're dealing with, they stem from this love for, this, for the brothers. The, the love that Peter has talked about as that essential love that we have for one another, the special love within the church. And this is, this is key to all the attitudes and the actions, and it, it's key to living the blessed life. Now, we've, we've talked about this at length, we have, about this love, but I want to point out uh, that this love is love that you can only have within the body of Christ because this is specifically the love that we have within this family of believers. A love empowered by Christ. But this love should be reflected still in our response to those outside the family of God. See, there is this special love within the church that should overflow to those we meet every day so that people would know us by our love for one another, as Jesus said. And really, I have to ask myself this question, and I hope that you do check with yourself. Like, do you live this out? Can you say that you have that, that feeling of love for one another in the church? And i got to say, being here so far, in the last, especially in the last couple months, we, we felt it, and we have so appreciated feeling that love here. Uh, and it should permeate everything we do. I, I know... I know that we have been loved well, and it is a sign to others when they see you loving your brothers and sisters in Christ well. People will see that. They will notice, and God will get the glory. Well, now we move back, take a step back, uh, and we take a look at this next item in our structure here, which is next to sympathy, and that's a tender heart. Now, I will say, this is a fun word. We've been talking about submission, which in the Greek is hubosasa, which is a very fun word. But this one even more so, uh, because the word that is used here is the word eusplachnos. Splachnos. I mean, that just is fun to say. And, and what it literally means is to have good intestines. Good intestines. Now, that's, that's a bit of an odd one for us, I think. Uh, but it did make me stop and think for a moment. That's not much weirder than us saying tender heart, right? I mean, what's the benefit of having like, the different texture of your heart, the organ that pumps your blood? Uh, well, no, yeah, for the Greeks, they felt that the center of all your emotions was in your guts and in your intestines. So, you felt things with your intestines. You can imagine why they believe that. It's pretty easy. I mean, if you're anxious, you can have stomach issues. If you're nervous, we've all felt those butterflies in our stomach before. And in fact, we still use these terms when we say, you know, we, we have gut feelings or you say, tell someone to just go with their gut. Well, you don't mean just go with their stomach. No, in most cases at least. Uh, so here, having good intestines is a way of saying, or, or a tender heart, means that you are positively dispositioned to somebody, that you feel for them. That it does create those emotions for you, there are those feelings for you when you are with them. It's different from sympathy, because sympathy is feeling what they feel and, and entering into that. This is being moved by what you feel for them. So it's two sides there of this working together. Uh, when you have a tender heart for somebody, or good intestines, depending on which translation you want to go with, you want the best, and what happens to them matters for you. Like I said, this works right alongside of sympathy. You feel what they feel, and then you want the best for them in an active way that's living it out. So be tender-hearted. Get excited when you see your brothers and sisters in the Lord. I know I am looking forward to when we can all be together again in service. It's something that I am excited for, and I know even in the times that I've had recently, just to spend a, a little bit of time with a few members in the church, that, that I do feel that. I, I get excited. It's been great. Uh, you know, we, we have that, um, that saying, absence makes the heart fonder. Um, that's what I'm, I'm excited about seeing everyone back and being able to experience those. But I know it, it's been great just seeing a, a few of you. And so we have to rejoice. Be tenderhearted. Be excited for people. Want their best. 
And the last one we have here, going along with united in mind, is being humble-minded. Because I'll tell you what, this really helps in being united in mind, if we can be humble-minded. Now, it's interesting here, as we get to this, out of all of these, this would have been an eye-opener for Peter's audience here. Uh, we live in, an, in a world that's inundated with Christian ideas. Whether or not things are Christian, we have these ideas of Christianity that are pretty prevalent in the culture. And one of them is that humility is supposed to be a good thing. Now, it might not always live out to be that case, but in general, people see that, oh yeah, humility is good. Uh, people will say that that's a good thing in someone's life, even if they don't want it in their own life. Um, it's something to attain to. But in Peter's day, this was an insult. This would have been the same as saying you are faint-hearted because people did not want to be humble. Your social standard wasn't based on being humble or not. Your, st- your social standard was based on how proud you could be. This was an unacceptable sign of weakness in this culture. Now, to be fair, while we have a veneer that says, oh, things are different, I think we really do find ourselves in this position a lot. Um, you know, we, we might not like pride, or we might say that pride is bad, but we sure like doing things that we can be proud of. Uh, we certainly like putting things on display. We, we certainly like having things our way. We like to be right. And pride, pride doesn't always seem like the worst sin to us at times, does it? And that's what makes unity of mind such a difficult thing. Because to be humble, to be humble-minded here is to think of the other better and think of them first. When you're able to do that and step beyond the pride, well, you're, you're putting them first. And those arguments, those arguments can dissipate. Those issues of opinion well, won't seem quite as important. And so as a final, the final attitude here, humble-minded, be humble-minded in what you do. See, the attitude of living a blessed life, these five things, unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, tender-hearted, and a humble mind. Well, I think, I think we know that if we live this way, life would be smoother, right? I mean, we can, we can see that in our minds, that if we actually lived out in this way, life would be smoother. We would get along, but things really get in the way, don't they? A difference of opinion seems like just too much, a bridge too far. You're tired and would rather just ignore someone else's problems rather than having to step in. Honestly, maybe you just don't like that person. There are just sometimes people, you know, you you just don't like them. Or you feel that you need to stand up for yourself first, you know? Something comes up and and finally you just need need to stand. So many things come up that can derail us from this path. And I'll tell you, truly, in our strength, this is impossible to lay hold to. These five attitudes are not attitudes that we can possibly hold on to, right? Oh, that's how it's supposed to be. So you're not going to live these things out by trying to live them out in your strength, in the flesh. You're not going to be able to grit your teeth, dig in, and get this done. Peter's not giving us five steps to spiritual maturity or, you know, seven steps on how to get your life aligned here. He is listing what it looks like to walk in this blessing. But the only way we can do it is by one step. And that step is trust in Christ. See, only Christ can do this in you. And he is there. If you've trusted in him, all the resources that you need to live this out in the church are available to you. Draw near to him and trust him. And then step out in faith. The faith that says, God, you are true. And what you say is true. Now when someone pushes those buttons for you in the church. Don't force yourself to be nice. Don't just put on that that outside image of cheerful happiness. Retreat to Christ. Retreat to Christ and let him live through you in response. You know, when I feel the flesh calling, when I feel flesh wanting to take the keys of those and either try and do this the right way in my strength because I can do it, or just give up on the right way altogether and just let it have its way. What I find is I I toss up this simple prayer. Uh, It's just this. Lord, may I walk in your spirit. And just real easy, real quick, I throw it out there. Lord, may I walk in your spirit. You know, just takes a moment. No one even needs to notice but I'll tell you, when I, when I take that time to draw near to him, it makes the world a difference. See, when, when you feel the flesh encroaching there, 
You know, when you want to just press on in your strength, when you want to put on that, that veneer and just say everything's fine, everything's happy, or you even want to lash out, well, just stop and pray. And you might find that as you do that, you have learned how to love that person as Christ works through you. This is our disposition within the church. And it should be reflected to those outside of it. And with these attitudes, though, we do get an action. And we need to live out this action when we're confronted with this world, which is very much opposed to us. And it is this. If we're going to live a blessed life, our action is to bless others. Uh, we, we pick this up in the next verse. Do not repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, bless. Now wait, come on, Peter. Really? You know, Peter says quite a few things that can uh, not be what we might expect. Do not repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling. How easy is that? Our first reaction to anything is to strike back and get even. Get revenge. You know, if someone hits you, be ready to hit back. You know, that, that, that was the whole purpose of, uh, you know, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, those rules that sound so harsh. I mean, that's a restriction. Because in truth, truth, without those, you do evil to me, well, I'm going to do it twice as much back to you. You know, the uh, great-grandson of Cain back in Genesis showed this pretty well. A guy by the name of Lamech. Lamech. He told his wife, man wounded me, so I killed him. My revenge is 77-fold. You do to me, and I'm going to get you back for 77 times. You know, God restricted that for the sake of peace. But we know the temptation. I mean, we experience this every time somebody does us wrong. Question, has, there ever, ever, has anyone ever honked a horn at you because you didn't hit the gas the instant the light turned green? I mean, it's just a noise. Nothing more. Nothing more than a noise. But what's the reaction? Now, I know when it's me, what I want to do. I want to just slowly let off the gas, come to a crawl, move very slowly, and I just I want them to feel all the rage and anxiety of being stuck behind me going so slow because they would have the audacity to honk a horn at me. You know, and if they fall into a ditch or something, well, you know, that's the Lord's way of getting back. Yeah, you know? Well, that's just a that's just a small one. A small example there. But in Christ, Christ. He's done away with this. He's done away with all of our getting even on our part. Instead of hurting or mocking or trying to get even, what are we to do? Slowly let off the gas and let them get angry and rageful behind us? Well, no, instead, instead we bless. We call out the good. We wish it on them and we seek it for them and we pray for them. This is true for both those inside and outside the church. So when you have someone insult you or do something that just makes you want to get back at them, pray for that person and see what happens to your own heart in that process as you step out in faith and pray. I heard the story uh, this week about a pastor who went to a, uh, went to a convention. While he was there, he met an old colleague of his in, the le in leadership of the denomination that he used to be a part of. Now, you get a bunch of pastors together uh, in a room, and there's sure to be some fireworks. It's a lot of fun. Uh, but this denominational leader, he, he, he saw this pastor, and he bristled. And when the pastor came to say hi, he looked at him, and he just said, we are enemies. Now, that's sad to hear someone in the church say that, but also, sadly, not too surprising. Have you ever felt like someone in the church was your enemy? Well, how do you react to something like that? Well, this pastor, he, he came right up, and he in an act of love that's pretty amazing to me, threw his arms around him, saying, praise God, now I have an opportunity to love my enemy. And then right there in love, prayed for him. Right there. Now, when we live this out, what it comes across as is, is extreme selflessness, putting other people first. And in fact, the truth is, again, like with the attitudes, we can't do that in our own strength. And that has been Peter's point all along. See, his argument has been that everything in this world, if we go back to chapter 1, everything in this world is just paper thin and worthless compared with the hope that we have. You know, we may feel downtrodden at times. We may feel as though we have oppressors over us. You know, in certain times we may even be killed. But reality just exists beyond this scheme here. Beyond what the way of the world, the way of the world, what it says is there. 
And that reality is that we have a power in us through the life of Christ that is unbreakable. We are sojourners in this place that does not see the vast wealth and security that we have. And we can lay down our pretensions here for the sake of others in the short time that we have. So when evil is done to us, we bless. And I'll say right now, this is a, this is a great reminder for me, and I hope for others right now in this time, because it can seem like we have a lot set against us as a church right now. We have a government that has shut us down for good reasons, sure, but still, it chafes. We have leadership that seems set against the church and government. What do we do? Do we protest? Do we resist? Do we grumble, mock, deride our leadership with our friends? What does Peter say? We are to bless. Be praying for those who you feel are set against you. You know, I, I'll tell you, I've been guilty of that. <laughs> I've been guilty of uh, mocking or, or saying things about ones set against us. It certainly seems. And, and this is something that can be convicting of me, reminding me, uh, I'm to bless those who do wrong to me. Not that they should come around, you know, we shouldn't be praying just that they come around to our way of seeing things. So that would be great. But we need to be praying and blessing them that God would be active in their lives. Blessing them and drawing them to him. Trust God with this. Because it's all about trust. First, do you trust God to take care of your needs? And second, do you trust God to make things right? If you trust God, submit as we have seen. And if you trust you'll make things right, bless those who do evil to you. We do this all with an aim, that we would live a blessed life, which is a life in relationship with God, seeking and trusting Him. So we pick up in our verse here. For to this you were called, that you may attain a blessing. For whoever desires to love life and see good days, let him keep his tongue from evil and its lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are open to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. When Peter says for this at the beginning there, he is speaking of all that he has been talking about. We're called to be the church, to live it out, love one another, submit in this world, and bless those who seek us harm. And in all of this, we obtain a blessing, a blessed life. Now we've seen this in all that Peter has been writing, and it's rooted in our hope, that hope that we have that can never go away. We can live a blessed life through suffering and trials, knowing that we are chosen of God. And here to bless others through the church. Because a blessed life is not health and wealth. It's much more than that. Now, those seem like a lot. Health and wealth. But really, again, those are just those paper thin, thin things that eventually, inevitably, will fail. I mean, wealth and health are not bad. Uh, but they're not the focus or our aim. Because uh, in a sense, really, I mean, you all who trust in Christ, have health and wealth, spiritual health in the life of Christ, and measureless wealth that is imperishable. Uh, but you also have a promise that you'll experience, that your experience of this time will be realized when Christ returns. In the here and now, these things are okay. Again, health and wealth are okay, but not at the expense of the more precious things. I mean, we live truly in the midst of health and wealth that was, would have been unimaginable to most of Peter's first audience here. But we know that it's all going to fade or fail. It doesn't matter how good your health is. One day, you will die. It doesn't matter how much wealth you have. The most important things in life truly are free. And even wealth runs out or ruins at some point. To be blessed is not to have it all. It's to live in understanding God and being in active relationship with Him. Knowing God and being in relationship with Him. That's a blessed life there. 
And Peter backs this up by turning it to the Old Testament. God's word is true. You can trust it. And that was just as true for Peter. And so he looks back and he quotes out of Psalm 34, the one that we spoke of a couple weeks ago, because this is one that um, Peter continues to look back to. And if you remember, this was the psalm that David sang during the time that Saul was seeking his life. In that legitimate fear, he had Saul, uh, Saul finding him. He, 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 he hid out. He actually got the sword of Goliath. And then he ran to the Philistine city of Gath, hoping to go unnoticed. Now, you just think about that for a second. Now, that's an interesting train of events there. He grabbed the sword of Goliath. Then he ran to the hometown of Goliath. This man who had been a great um, warrior who killed many Philistines to one of their hometowns, hoping to go unnoticed. Well, it's not surprising sort of what happens here. Uh, he's recognized by the guards. They call the king of Gath to come out and see him. And realizing his danger... David begins to act insane. He begins banging on the gate, drooling through his beard. And the king sees this and ignores him and says, What? Do I need another crazy man? Send him on his way. And that's what happened. David runs, hides out in a cave, and likely there writes the psalm that we read that starts with these words. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul makes its boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord, and he answered me, and deliver me from all my fears. Wait. Your experience is not living up to what you're praising, David. This doesn't sound like a man who just ran away from Gath, who has people out to kill him, whose own mentor, the king of his own country, who he has fought side by side with, is out for his life, and yet he praises him like this? Because this lines up with the truth that David knew. And we see this continued in what Peter quotes today. Now, I can't imagine what state of mind David would have been in at that point. Everything that he had hoped for seemingly dashed. Now on the run, hiding out in a cave from his greatest enemies. He, he ran to the people he used to fight and had to get away from them. And now hunted down by his own king. I mean, he suffered greatly. He was forced to flee before many an, uh, enemies. But he could still talk of loving life and in seeking God. And he knew what it was to live a blessed life. It's not about having it easy or getting what you want. A blessed life doesn't look like a full bank account or a car, or in his case, maybe a chariot, that you want in your garage. A blessed life is one on which the Lord looks a one in which the Lord hears your prayers. If you want to love life and seek, see good days, David says to keep your tongue from evil. Don't attack people with your words or speak deceit. But turn from evil, do good, and seek peace. You can sort of see where Peter is building his argument here on this letter using this psalm. Do that so the eyes of the Lord will be on you and he will hear your prayers. What is in mind here is an open relationship with God. That image of his eyes being on you is an image that you're face to face with God, that you're in relationship with him, that he sees you and that he is providing for you. And then he hears your prayers. And then we have the dichotomy here that Peter has been using himself. One side are the exiles who are living that way, and the other side is the world that is, as he would say, evil and set against God, so that God's face is against them. Of course, these things are true, whatever you're doing. If you are trusting, if you have trusted in Christ as your Savior, you have a relationship with Him. And regardless of your position with Christ, He does see you, and He does hear you because He is almighty, omnipotent God. But what's really talked about here is the idea of that quality of relationship that you're experiencing with Him. And this is a beautiful thing, that it's not out of our effort, but this is truly out of trusting Christ. Because we've all experienced that back and forth in life. I mean, there are times when it seems like your relationship with God is great. It's active, it's wonderful, you, you feel Him moving, you're in prayer, you're in the Word, things are just going well. You have a goal, you have things you're working towards. It's great, you're growing and you're walking. Well, then either you screw up, or you, know, you, 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 pro, you, you hit a plateau, maybe you spiral out a bit, maybe you just butter to a stop in your relationship with God. Well, what do you do? 
What do you do when that happens? God didn't stop loving you. He didn't stop having a relationship with you. You know, we often, we often stop believing in our relationship with Him. Not, not that we stop believing in Him, but we stop seeing ourselves as holy and redeemed before Him, able to come before our God boldly, and so we stop coming before Him boldly. The way to get back to this isn't to do penance. It's not to work up some level of, of holiness. It's not to just do these steps and get things right that way because you can't do anything about it in your own strength to bring it about. You need to trust God and step out as though what He says is true is true. Trust that Christ made you righteous and you'll be able to come boldly before God. And that is a blessed life there. You have a blessed life. You have a blessed life in Christ and you can walk out that. You can walk out those things that we've seen, those attitudes there. You can walk out the action of blessing others even when they uh, do evil towards you. And you can have a relationship with God, walking well with Him, because God has provided that for you. And you can trust Him and walk in that. Because if you've accepted Christ as your Savior, that is the truth for you. Whether or not you live that truth out at the moment is what is at stake here, and this is our aim to walk in faith and live that out. So what we've seen today in the text is Peter's encouragement for us to live a blessed life. That is the aim we have in what we do. Uh, but it's not a blessed life as the world would think it. It is a life that seeks to love those around us with unity of mind, humility, sympathy, and compassion that is willing to bless others rather than curse and that keeps his eyes on God. So you have a hope that goes beyond anything in this world. You can bring glory to God living in this blessing. And this is what a truly blessed life is. And you have it if you have Christ. So trust Him and live in it. Let us pray. Lord, I thank You for Your goodness. And I thank You for Your blessing. I thank You for Your provision that we can be before You. That we can trust You and walk in You and know that You are a good God. Lord, as we Go out in this day, I pray that we would walk in the blessed life, that you provide for us a life that is in relationship with you. Lord, I ask a special prayer, especially on this day too, that uh, you would bless the moms out there that have endured so much, who have walked through many of the things that we've talked uh, about today in raising kids and loving them well. And I know the many places I've seen that in my own life, in my own mom, and again, mother of my children, Lord, I thank you for the blessing that they are. May they know your blessing in this day. Thank you for your goodness, Lord. I pray that you'd be with us as we walk through this week, that we would walk in you, trusting you, living out these things with the attitudes that you've, just, that you've put out there for us, with the actions that we can walk in. I thank you for being our God. May we trust you, walk in you, and know what it means to have life in you as we abide. And I pray this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, thank you, everybody joining us today online. Uh, again, I look forward to seeing you in person. We will be having coffee hour at 1 o'clock, uh, so in just about an hour. Uh, and so we'd love to see you there. Um, I know many are busy with uh, Mother's Day things, mostly at home. Um, but I, I would love to see a few of you there at coffee hour today. May you all be blessed. Uh, happy Mother's Day. And may the grace of God be with you. Take care there. Bye. Bye.